Hi everyone. I know it's been a few days since I've gone live, so I wanted to give you all an update on some things that are going on with us and just the war circumstances. Um, so yeah, I've been pretty busy. Um, the reason I haven't been able to update in a while is because Friday last week I was a guest on um, the Theology Mom podcast, which is one of my favorite podcasts. So I put a lot of time and effort into preparing for that, and we pre-recorded. Um, so Krista Bontrager, who's the host, she'll be editing that. Um, I'm going to link her YouTube um, channel below so you guys can go ahead and subscribe. And then when the video finally drops, you, you might even see it before me because of the time difference. I'm not, I'm not really sure, but um, she's become a really good friend of mine and uh, it's always really an honor to be on her show. Also, her ministry partner, um, Monique Dusan, they have a ministry together called the Center for Biblical Unity. Uh, Monique has been working on um, some content relating the pro-Palestinian cause to um, critical race theory, which I'm just so blown away that she's doing that and so thankful. <laughs> I'm actually going to cry. Thank you, Monique. <laughs> um, but AZ and I have been talking about these sorts of things for a really long time at Save News. I'll link up our Save News channel below too when I'm done. Um, and I'm just... I'm seriously crying. <laughs> Thank you, Monique. But I'm just so grateful that somebody else would pick up this idea and really do some work on it, especially since that is what they do over um, at the Center for Biblical Unity, Christy and Monique, uh, Krista and Monique together. Um, Krista's also been doing some podcasts on Islam. She's a theologian, so... Uh, she's breaking this down. So I think you guys will find their content really helpful for helping to understand the bigger picture of what's going on here right now. So I'll definitely link both of those for you all. But um, yeah, that just took a, a lot of my time just to prepare and get ready for that. And then of course, like since I have endocrine issues that I'm still recovering from, I have to pace myself. Uh, Sunday, I had a chance to volunteer, which was amazing. Um, some friends of mine have been organizing volunteer efforts at the ho hotels where families from the south uh, in the villages that were massacred have evacuated. And uh, with Devin's schedule being so intense, he's a high school principal and he was working 16 hour days the first few weeks of this war, like the first two weeks. And so it just didn't leave time for me to do anything really out of the house and um, Sunday an opportunity came up that worked perfectly for our schedule and my skill set. I went and did some crafts with the ladies, um, with the kids. I had an older group from age 8 to 12 and um, I'll just say when I got home I had to just sit and cry for a while. Um, you know, the little kids, they bounce around and I think sometimes it's hard to see the trauma on them, but when they get to be about 11 or 12, you can tell that they're, they were really affected, you know? So, um, it was really, it was really meaningful and I'm hoping that I can help out at that particular hotel more often because it's close to my house. Um, it's all very unorganized here, you know, like we got dragged into this war and, um, just going to help out, it's not, it's, it's like they can even tell you a time and you get there and they're like, can you come back at a different time, you know? Uh, so it's really hard, but I'm going to do what I can do and um, try to, um, you know, keep up with those kids the best that I can. Because one of the things I was thinking about while I was there was that they really need the same group of adults to show up um, on a regular basis, you know, I think that would be helpful for them. Um, the Ministry of Education actually sends teachers to the hotels, too. I was learning this from my friends that organize these events. And, you know, they were saying that they had to work with the school schedule. Um, so there's just a lot going on with that. And uh, the kids were sweet. Um, you know, since they're minors, I don't want to disclose too much. But I will say one of them did want to really talk about what she was seeing in Hollywood. Like how people in Hollywood were pro-Hamas and that was confusing for her. So we, you know, I'm not a counselor, so I didn't, I didn't try to counsel her, but I did listen and 
uh, just reminded her that a lot of Americans really support Israel. And she said, yes, I know, you know, but um, those of you who do have counseling ministries, um, you might consider coming over here and helping after things. Okay, am I, am I still here? Okay. <laughs> My internet just bugged out for a second. But yeah, like those of you who have counseling ministries, you really might consider coming over when things are safer um, and doing some, you know, trauma work with with the people here because there's a lot. There's just so much. Um, okay, so with that, <laughs> uh, you guys, it's going to be a long time. Um, I saw a report yesterday that the IDF, an IDF spokesman was predicting that this could take six to nine months, which is just extremely daunting to think about, um, you know, a war going on that long. Um, I pray about that, and I just, you know, I saw, you know, back in 1967, the Lord did so much in six days, <laughs> in the six-day war, and I think it would be worth it for us to pray that this wouldn't take six to nine months, and that the Lord would do something miraculous, and, um, you know, bring a conclusion to this in a miraculous way, um, and I think with that too, like I wanted to recommend that you guys watch a series, a film series called Against All Odds. It's so good. <laughs> I've been watching that just to build my faith, but it's a film series that was um, made by a journalist named Michael Greenspan, where he goes in and he interviews Israelis about different miracles they, that they have seen take place as the nation of Israel has formed. And it will really build your faith. Um, there's one story about minefield where a gust of wind, during the Six-Day War, a gust of wind came through in the Golan Heights and exposed all the mines so that soldiers could walk through. Um, but it is really amazing, and it has caused me to really pray for the miraculous for this war. Um, we are dealing with tunnels under Gaza. Uh, recently, they shared, the IDF shared that the quote unquote Pentagon for Hamas is actually located under Shifa Hospital, which is the biggest hospital in Gaza. Um, Y'all, when we say they're using human, they're using people, civilians as human shields, that is not rhetoric. They literally are. <laughs> I mean, their Pentagon is under a hospital. Uh, this is extremely complicated, and I really trust that the IDF has a plan, but we got to pray this through, right? Because they've got to dismantle Hamas in this really complex tunnel system in a very densely populated area and even under a hospital, which is where civilians go for medical care. <laughs> so um, we just have so much going on and with that, and I really think this is a time for us to just continue to step up prayers and with them saying that this could be six to nine months body of messiah you guys have a big challenge can you guys pray this in for that long do you guys think you can endure um i hope so i'm praying that you all will endure with us as people praying for israel um you know you need to pray for us to endure here on the ground but i'm also praying for you guys to continue to just endure in your support um, you know, and continuing to contact your representatives and telling them to defund terrorist organizations, to, to stop, to defund the Palestinian Authority because of pay for slay, to defend, defund the UN, who has not shown unbiased support for Israel, defend Iran, defend Qatar, you know, that you all would continue to write them and express your desires about this. Um, that you all would continue to meet with your churches and pray. Um, this is a big effort. And I think what's really amazing right now is that the Israelis do see that you all are standing with them. And let's just do what we can to keep that going. I know it's going to be a long time, but let's um, keep it moving. Um, some other general updates. Let's see. Okay, so Bibi gave a really great speech the other night. Um, I watched it 
this morning because I had biblical Hebrew last night. And uh, I thought he did a great job. Um, I was not a fan of his COVID policies. And I've had to do some forgiving of him. <laughs> um, but I thought his speech was excellent. And he just basically reiterated to everyone that we didn't ask for this war. That it was existential for the survival of the state of Israel and the Jewish people. And that we were not going to enter into a ceasefire agreement until the job was done. And I think that's really what most of um, Israeli citizens want. I don't, I've never heard anyone so far say, hey, I'm really happy. I'd be really happy for a ceasefire. Like, we're all ready for Hamas to be done. Um, oh, speaking of Hamas, they shared, the um, leader of Hamas shared, he's in Beirut. He's not even here. He's not in the tunnels. He's in Beirut. He's a multi-billionaire in Beirut. <laughs> uh, he shared with the Financial Times that he wasn't expecting this much response from the United States. So uh, thank you to all the Americans who are serving and all the armed forces. We are so grateful over here. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, they weren't expecting that, and I think that's made a difference for what we're experiencing here so far. Um, I did have a sad story to share. Um, I hate to share this, but I just, guys, I hate sharing these things, but I just think that we have to know, right? Um, you know, like, you have to know. Um, but we had a, um, one of our head first responders was at a meeting the other day, and he was able to share some testimonies about his experiences. And he shared one that was just beyond, beyond horrifying. Um, they found a baby in an oven, and uh, later on they found the video cam of what happened. And uh, basically what happened is on October 7th, um, during the massacre, the terrorists went to the home of a family. They put a baby in an oven on high heat and shot the father and then gang raped the mother while she was um, hearing her baby cry. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I'm crying again. I just, you know, I can't convey enough to you all that there is no moral equivalency between Israel defending itself uh, and having um, civilian casualties of war and a war for self-defense and what happened on October 7th and what we've dealt with over here. Um, I, I just can't stress that enough. Like there is no moral equivalency and seriously you all, um, it is time for people to stop trying to toe the line in order to make their Arab friends feel better. Um, Pick a position. Don't be lukewarm. Be either hot or cold. But exercise moral clarity on this. Um, you know, think about what happened during the Holocaust. And you need to ask yourself if you're going to be a Corey Ten Boom, you know. And um, will you stand with Israel to the point that it would cost you something? And that is a question that all of us should be asking. And with that, if enough of us speak up, do we need to, would we even need to go to that point, right? Um, Isaiah, this is going to be the only verse I share with you all today. Because I, I just wanted to do a little bit more, you know, just general update. But Isaiah 62, one says, For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation as a burning torch. So you guys, for Jerusalem's sake, don't be silent. Please speak up. Post on your social media that you stand with Israel. Share what is true, what is good, what is right, what is holy. Um, don't be afraid. Just continue to speak out on what's true and just continue to stand with Israel because it does make a difference. It really does. Um, so just keep on, okay? Uh, all right, so I did have um, three questions come in. I asked you guys, like, what would you kind of like to talk about? And um, I had three, three people respond. Well, one of them was a bunch of people. <laughs> okay, so the first one's about Hamas and the Bible. And I've had a lot of people ask me 
about um, the passage that's going around from Genesis 6 that uses the word Hamas. And someone asked me last night, right before I was going into biblical Hebrew. So I thought I would just talk about that real quick and tell you what my biblical Hebrew instructor said. (laughs) Um, I pulled it up so I could read it to you. So let's just see here. Okay. Um, It says, Vatishachet ha'eretz lifnei Ha'elohim timale ha'eretz hamas. Okay, so that is Genesis 6:11. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And hamas there means violence. Okay, so flip it back to me. Um, yeah, so I've had a lot of people ask me about this, and because you guys know I love biblical Hebrew, I'm not super awesome at it. I'm advanced now. I'm in level D and the highest level is level E, so I'm doing good, but I still have to use a lot of study tools to um, work through my lessons. (laughs) Y'all, I've struggled so much with Hebrew. That would be a big prayer point for me if you could just pray that I would have better ease with the language. I would appreciate that. But I love biblical Hebrew so much. So um, I looked at it, and I always want to be, like, intellectually honest and responsible because I heard that, and I was like, wow, that is really an interesting coincidence. (laughs) Uh, So I talked to my biblical Hebrew professor about it because I personally have not found a connection where Hamas might have taken a biblical Hebrew word to use it as their name. Hamas, of course, is a, it's an acronym for the Arabic of the Islamic resistance movement. Um, but I don't know if they played with that acronym to be intimidating in this way or what. I'm not sure. But when I asked my biblical Hebrew professor about it, he was like, it does, in fact, mean violence. And I would just say, if the shoe fits, wear it. <laughs> so um, I don't know if that answers any questions for you all. But, you know, if the shoe fits, wear it. God's word is living and active. And um, it is a very interesting coincidence, we'll just say. So I hope that kind of speaks to that issue. You can let me know if you have further questions or if any of you have found uh, more of a direct connection, you can let me know about that too. Um, Another question someone had um, is, this one's from Kimberly M. She said, are you seeing many hearts softening to Yeshua or questions being asked? Okay, so for this one, I'll just say, when it comes to the Jewish people, I really just let them know who I am and what I believe and let them approach me about anything because we have a history of forced conversions. And the thing is, guys, is you can't actually force someone to believe in Yeshua. I, I've explained this to friends before. Like, you can't force someone to believe in Yeshua. You know, like, if you believe in Yeshua, it's because God gave you revelation. <laughs> it's a personal decision that you make, and no one can force you into that. Someone can force you into traditions, but no one can force you into personal belief. And But we have a history in the church, unfortunately, of times where we force conversions to the point of death, and we often required the Jewish people to do things to prove their conversion, like eat pork. Um, we did some really horrific things, guys. So I usually just express who I am and allow people to come to me with questions. With my um, Muslim friends, when I have a, have a chance to interact, I'm a little bit more direct. But my Jewish friends, I give them space. And right now, I am mostly just trying to mourn with those who mourn and serve them and encourage them in however I can. But I will say that they are recognizing that you all are standing with them. And I think that is huge and important and something that you need to know um, because there has been such a long history of Christian anti-Semitism. We've done so many wrong things. Like Christian anti-Semitism is responsible for the Crusades where Jewish communities were... um, massacred. We were responsible for um, the Inquisition. Um, The church did not stand up enough during the Holocaust. There's a lot more I could say about that, but we are responsible for a lot. So just the fact that they are watching you all stand with them is extremely important. Um, So just continue to keep that up, okay? Uh, And then another one that I had is Oh, I really appreciate this question, actually. Um, This one was from Sheila L. And she said, 
she sent this to me in a private message. She said, what do you see the Holy Spirit doing? Um, I appreciate this because I usually, I really like for my ministry to be characterized by the word and by facts. I'm, I love apologetics and I like to be very factual and I like to rightly divide God's word. So I don't always talk about my subjective experiences. And so I just actually really appreciated that she um, cared about what I was discerning and what I was seeing here. And so I'll tell you what I see the Holy Spirit doing. For one, I see a great healing in Israel because we've had a lot of division. We had a lot of division during COVID. You know, we had the green passport, which is, it was just extremely divisive. Um, and then we've done, we've got, been going through this issue of the judicial reform uh, where Prime Minister Netanyahu wanted to make changes to the Supreme Court, but with a very extremist government and in a way that was very, what we would call in the States, very partisan and dealing with an issue that's essentially constitutional. So we've had a lot of division and I've seen my Israeli neighbors pull together, beyachad, that's together in Hebrew. Like everybody is beyachad, we're together. Um, if you look at some of the reports, we've had a 120% turnout for reservists and that is just phenomenal. That means more people <laughs> than what we're called in showed up to serve, okay? And what's really significant about that right now is that during the protest for the judicial reform, um, the reservists were refusing to show up as an act of protest. So here we have a war suddenly and we just have had um, more than who was called in show up, which is just phenomenal. We, I, I, my understanding is that we, we're, this is the first time in history that more people have come into a country for war than gone out. Um, so there's just something really amazing that the Lord is doing here in terms of bringing unity back into the nation and healing some of those rifts that were taking place. I mean, we are very unified. Even though there's a really deep grief and mourning happening, morale is so high. People are so confident in what the IDF could be doing and what they're doing right now. Um, I'm just realizing too that there's a few things about what they're doing I didn't really touch on. Like they're doing ground invasions and they haven't gone in in like a giant mass. They've been going in in small groups, like small units and then retreating. Uh, so apparently this is working really well though. So um, I'm thankful for that, for that. And I also forgot to mention that we had a soldier being held hostage that was rescued. <laughs> uh, some of the news reports were saying she was released. No, she wasn't released. She was rescued by Shinbed and IDF. Okay, so um, that language is very important. So um, yeah, there's just a lot of confidence in, what, in, in the IDF and there's morale is up. Um, I think people are very optimistic, and I just really see God's goodness. I mean, um, even just a little while ago, I was outside at the park with my with my youngest, Yaniv, and our dog, and um, I just really, I, it's really hard to explain, guys, but there's times when we're in conflicts here, and I just really feel the presence of the Lord in the land differently. Um, you know, I mean, that's just my personal experience, but he's just really here, you know. Um, so I see the Holy Spirit doing a great work of bringing unity, and um, I'm just really thankful for that. The other thing is that I, I see the Lord opening up a lot of people's eyes and hearts to Israel globally. And I'm really sorry that it took such loss of life for this to happen, but... Um, May their lives not be lost in vain if, um, you know, the nations get behind what Israel is doing. And, and believers in particular, I, I'm seeing so many people beginning to really challenge supersessionism. Um, I'm working on a teaching for you all on supersessionism, replacement theology. Um, it's almost done, so we'll do that soon. But, you know, I'm just seeing people understand. It's like the, their eyes and hearts are opening to the reality that, Israel is still elect and still has a purpose in God's plan. And the, the people of Israel are the apple of God's eyes. Um, you know, um, I, it seems like a lot of scales are falling off. Like even things like being able to recognize in America that 
the pro-Palestinian cause isn't aligned with a biblical worldview. Um, you know, this, this is something that I've been talking about in my articles at Save News for a long time. And I'm just, just blown away by how people are finally getting it, you know. Um, it shouldn't be that complex. I mean, if you look at the protest, you look at who's gathering at the protest, it's people who don't adhere to a biblical worldview. So that should give you some red flags and just be like, I need to think about this, you know. Um, but I'm really thankful just to see people coming into a love for Israel and people really recognizing um, that the other position isn't of the Lord. And that's not to say we don't love our Arab neighbors. Please love and pray for your Arab neighbors. But you guys, there's a reason we call it a Judeo-Christian worldview and not an Islamo-Christian worldview, right? The worldview that they have is not our worldview. It's not, you know, I mean, I even think about the Canaanite conquest, for example, you know, and rabbinic thought that was something that was, it's a, that portion of scripture is descriptive text of a very specific command that the Lord gave in a very specific era. It's not in Judaic worldview, Judaic rabbinic thought that we should just go on and completely decimate all of our enemies. That's not Jewish thought, right? But unfortunately, the Quranic teachings are to destroy the Jewish people. That's not politically correct, but it is accurate. That is what the Quran says it is. And it's not just a pre or descriptive passage, it's prescriptive and it's part of their eschatology. And that's why Muslims can radicalize against the Jewish people so easily is because that's present. We don't share, as Christians, we don't share that worldview. But we do share, outside of salvation and Messiah Yeshua, we share a moral worldview with our Jewish neighbors. And sometimes I'm just aghast at like <laughs> how this seems lost on people. Um, but I am seeing people who even maybe prescribe to some areas of replacement and fulfillment theology, supersessionism, um, turning their hearts towards God's chosen people and uh, recognizing um, that this is a just war and that God has plans for Israel. Um, so I think that would be the other thing that I see the Holy Spirit doing that I'm really encouraged about. And there's just a real sweetness in the Lord here right now. Like our prayer meetings are so good. Um, you know, my pastor, his father was the, uh, his father is Colonel Elazar Amitai, and he was the commander of the Jerusalem Brigade in the 1967 war, the Six Day War. And his unit took large areas of territory um, out in kind of like East Jerusalem from Jordan. And that's the inheritance that my pastor has brought into our congregation. And um, there's just a power on his preaching right now. And when he calls us to pray, it is so strong and so good. Um, but the Lord is really present, guys. We feel him. I'm so encouraged by being meeting with other believers and hearing testimonies for them about experiences that they're having in the Lord right now. And it's just really good. I mean, we're not... We're not in a spirit of fear. We're very confident in what the Lord is doing and um, hopeful and optimistic and trusting and, you know, trying to stay in the word more in the news. <laughs> but God is really good and, um, yeah, he's really present. So um, thank you to Sheila for asking me that. I'm really grateful. Um, yeah, so I think that's basically all I had to update with you guys with today, I am working on a teaching on replacement theology, so we will talk about that hopefully next time. Um, it's just hard to say because sometimes things here can happen so much. Like yesterday, we actually had sirens in Jerusalem again. You know, it's been so quiet, but we didn't hear them at our house. Um, I'm actually glad that my kids didn't hear them because I was napping. I was so tired yesterday. I had to nap. And... Um, I woke up and I saw on my phone that there had been sirens in Jerusalem and I was like, did you guys hear it? And they were like, nope. And I said, okay, then it must have been fine. <laughs> but, you know, things are just changing really fast and, you know, 
I might have a plan to talk about one thing and then we end up having a major event take place and that's diverted. Um, some things that I've said I wanted to talk about, um, I did talk about with Krista in the interview. Um, I'm not gonna share too much because I wanna give her space to edit according to what, what makes sense for her audience. And whatever she uh, doesn't cover, we might cover here. Um, but yeah, look for that and um, it should drop sometime this week. So look for that on Theology Mom. But thank you all so much for all of your love and support and um, praying for Israel and just really standing with us right now. God is doing something. I like to say Aslan is on the move. <laughs> all right. Bye, everyone. Love you.